cool. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. I know there's a really good talk on at the same time, so I appreciate your presence. Um, my name's Joe. I'm an Android engineer at a company called Buffer, and we do a social uh, media scheduling tool. Um, so I'm an Android developer there. Um, but on the side, I like to explore new things that come out and play around with them. And one of these things recently has been TensorFlow. So I only started looking at TensorFlow about six months ago. And someone bought me a book as a present. And I was initially quite scared to look at it. But it turned out to not be so bad. So in this talk, we're going to be taking an introductory look at TensorFlow and how we can be using it in our mobile applications. So it is an introductory talk. So if you've already done stuff to do with TensorFlow or machine learning, um, I don't know how much we'll take away from this other than my viewpoint on things. Um, so we're not going to be taking a deep dive into machine learning or data science, um, but we will be looking at how we, can, how we can use TensorFlow in our apps, how we can take existing models and retrain them for our purposes. So I'm not going to make you a machine learning master or be able to um, deep dive into machine learning practices, but hopefully I'll give you an introductory knowledge into TensorFlow, and maybe it'll make you curious enough to go away and sort of explore things further for yourself. So the word machine learning over the last few years has probably been quite hard to escape from, um, especially in the Android community, it's been quite um, growing. In case you're not aware of what machine learning is, so machine learning is the process of applying artificial intelligence to our applications to allow them to give them the ability to learn automatically, um, giving us the ability to improve our products for our users without needing to manually encode any of these behaviors. So this process is focused on applications that have some form of data that can use that data to learn things for themselves and then um, give something back to our users in the form of that. So these applications will observe that data we give them, they'll look for patterns in them, and then use those patterns to influence and make decisions on future work that takes place in those apps. So not only does this make less work for us, because it means the machines are doing half the stuff for us, but it gives us a better experience for our users. So the users, we can create a more frictionless experience within applications, and users can achieve things in less clicks. So when it does come to machine learning, um, these are just a couple of foundations of techniques and practices that are used within machine learning themselves. So maybe if you think of something in the future that, oh, I want to know how to do this in machine learning, then maybe you can apply one of these techniques to that. So there's two core types of, machine, of practices that can be used within machine learning. Um, one is called unsupervised learning, and the other is called supervised learning. Does this work? Cool. So in unsupervised learning, um, the purpose of that is to find hidden patterns hidden patterns or intrinsic structures within data. So for example, um, we would have an input data set and that is unlabeled, and then we'll need to take the input data and um, create some form of output from it. And because we don't have those labels on that input data, and we don't have um, a massive amount of information about the data that's been input. So for this, one of the main approaches that's used to, to retrieve a result from that input data is called clustering. And this is, there's other techniques, but, um, and we're not going to look too much into this one today, but clustering is um, a technique that's commonly used in super, uh, unsupervised learning. So it's used for exploratory data analysis, so things such as um, sequence analysis, market research, and in some cases, object recognition. So clustering, for example, because we don't have um, input labels on certain things, uh, there's a couple of examples that I have for you. So, for example, if I was to make um, tailor, if we wanted t-shirts for everyone in this room, it would be too expensive for us to tailor make all the t-shirts. So clustering would be um, grouping people into similar groups of t-shirt sizes. And we can also have things such as um, segmented customers for market research, so things for like data analysis or SEO, um, so we can do targeted marketing on groups of people. Also, anything to do with grouping things into similar collections is known as clustering. We also have another one, another technique called supervised learning. Um, so this is the one that I've, I've been using a bit more when playing around with TensorFlow, and this is the one we're going to be focusing on a bit more today. So supervised learning is one that builds a model that's based on predictions. So the algorithm takes input data, um, as well as the known responses. So with supervised learning, you know the input data and you know the possible output responses. And what, you, what your model essentially will be doing is taking that input, input data, performing some analysis and some magic behind the scenes, and mapping those input datas to the possible output datas that you're already aware of. So if you already know the data that 
you want to have output, then you're going to be using supervised learning. So again, so here there's two types of possible techniques you can use for supervised learning. So classification techniques are for discrete responses. So say um, an email is spam or not, or a picture is a cat or it's not a cat. So it's kind of uh, like a yes or a no response. So things such as Im image recognition, speech recognition, credit scoring and stuff like that would be used for classification. So if your data can be tagged um, or separated into groups, then again, this is where you would use classification in um, your TensorFlow applications. There's another one which I haven't actually looked too much into, which is called regression. And it's for things, for situations where your um, analysis can be continuous responses and can change like unpredictably or a lot, such as like prediction of house prices, temperature, uh, energy consumption, and so on. And we're not gonna be really looking at that one today. The main one we're gonna be using in an example is classification. But how does this all fit in with mobile? And so one of my main thoughts when, when I got given this book was how can I use this? Like machine learning is great and in, you know, in principle it's really cool, but how can we use this in our mobile applications? Um, but already a lot of the applications that I've uh, have obvious uses of it are Google applications. <laughs> so not the best use case because um, there are other applications using it in the Play Store, but some things we can look at um, on Google Apps are Google Photos, for example, you can search for cat or whatever you have in your album, and your photos will be shown that have those objects. And that's machine learning because it's grouping those um, recognized images and displaying those results to you. So here I've searched cat, and you can see all the pictures. I have quite a lot of cat pictures on my phone. Um, I don't dress my cat up in weird clothes. That's a bandage, just to point out. Um, and also in the Gmail app, they, we have these things called smart replies. You haven't, if you don't use the Gmail app or you haven't seen this before, we have um, free textual suggestions at the bottom, which, are, um, which use machine learning to generate these. So you can, um, so that machine learning code will generate these responses for you based on the email, and you can tap one of those responses to automatically reply. I've never used that because they're quite blunt, <laughs> but, um, but I think it was last year, I think it's 12% of all my emails sent from the Gmail app were using um, this fast reply. So if you're, if you're like, if you haven't got time to type something or um, you, know, you just need to send a quick response to someone, then this is perfect. And there's also other use cases such as um, Google Translate uses it and other apps such as Google Play Movies and apps and games and, and so on, YouTube video recommendations, they all use machine learning. And you know, there's other, other places we can use machine learning in our own apps um, such as for example, um, uh, our, app, our app on iOS uses machine learning to automatically tag images with, um, with tags based on the image that has been uploaded. So this all sounds pretty complex, to, but um, luckily we have a tool called TensorFlow that's available to us. And again, um, you've probably heard the word TensorFlow or you may have looked at TensorFlow yourself. It's an open source library that is um, owned by Google. And I'm pretty sure it's what they use in most of their machine learning products, uh, applications using machine learning. Um, because it's open source, there's a really good community around it and really good community support. So if you get stuck on anything, there's a lot of help on Stack Overflow and so on. And one of my favorite things about it is that it's cross-platform. So if you have a web app, if you have an Android app and an iOS app, you can take the models that you have on your team and you can share them throughout your team and reuse the same model. So you can, have this, you can share the same learnings, you can share the same optimizations, and you can share the same hurdles that you face. You haven't got to have your own implementation per platform. You can take the same model and share it throughout your team and make use of that. So with the current version of TensorFlow, the way it works is that you essentially code, um, you write code to build a computational graph um, and that graph gets executed. And that graph represents the data structure um, that describes the computation that you want to perform. So these are the, um, the tasks you want to carry out to retrieve um, the result. So without getting too deep into what computational graphs are, um, I'm just trying to touch everything on a, on a high level here. But um, computational graphs are essentially um, a collection of nodes that all perform operations. So we, we'll chuck some input data into our graph, and then as that data moves through those nodes, these, um, these nodes will perform operations, uh, manipulate the data, and comp compute values and eventually we'll reach our end result, which will have some value that is our um, predicted result. So it's kind of a descriptive language that's used to describe deep learning models. 
And these computational graphs can also be known as neural networks. And again, that's probably a term um, you've probably heard quite a bit of over the last few years, and it's just been added to, um, I think it was a recent version of Android support library. But these neural networks um, can be used and, and enabled to predict and recognize things. So a neural network is essentially a function that can learn. So we can input an, some image into our neural network, and, and our neural network will do some, do some, use some magic and calculate some result. But because our neural network needs to learn, we first need to teach it how to recognize the things that we want it to learn. So for example, if I want it to recognize cat images, dog images, or images of fruit, I need to give it images of those objects that I want it to recognize so that it knows what they look like. And our recognition of our neural network is only going to be as good as our data set. If we give it one image of a cat and two images of a dog, it's going to have a pretty tarm, hard time recognizing the different photos of cats we may give it. So when it comes to machine learning, or even getting started with machine learning, it can be a lot to take on. And when I first wanted to look into it, um, I was quite put off. And originally, I honestly put the, the book I got given as a gift. I didn't touch it for a few months, because I was scared of um, <laughs> getting stuck into data science. Um, as a mobile developer, um, I want to create things and want to create solutions for users. And I thought, do I need to pick up my maths book again? Do I need to learn data science? Um, and I thought it was going to be pretty complex. But um, one thing that's great about TensorFlow is you can export the models that you've created or that other people have created um, from their graphs and reuse them. You can retrain them um, and then per um, retrain them to the purpose of your application. So you can take what's what has already been created and what's already been trained in someone else's project, and then retrain it for your own needs. And whilst there may not be a model implementation that is used to recognize exactly what you want to know, um, you can take that model and, and tweak it a bit and retrain it to your needs. And that's what um, I want to look at in the rest of this talk. So in, what we're going to be doing is looking at how we can take a pre-existing model, which is already provided by TensorFlow, and use it to recognize artifacts of our choosing. So a little sample project that I made, it's not the most exciting form of recognition, um, it's just the first thing I could find in my house, is something that recognizes different types of fruit. So I was trying to think, in, uh, in the UK we have, so we have this shop called Tesco's and you carry around this barcode scanner and you have to scan every single barcode of item you want to buy. And then at the end you have to scan that scanner on a till. And I was thinking, oh, maybe this could be something in the future. You, you um, use your phone to recognize images for the shop, and you add these items to your cart. Um, so yeah, so this sample application essentially recognizes fruit. Um, so the models from this and, and most of the application is available from the TensorFlow repository. Um, I've tweaked it a little bit, so I will push it up onto my own GitHub um, probably this week. So all I've done is essentially taken their model and retrained it and optimized it to recognize the things that I want it to recognize. So whilst my application is just recognizing fruit, if you're creating something that is used to recognize images or some form of objects, you can do exactly the same with a data set of your own choosing. So before we start and, look in, and start looking at how we can retrain the models, I want to look, just mention something that comes with the TensorFlow package, and it's called TensorBoard. And what this essentially is, is a suite of visual, visualization tools that you can use to sort of analyze your models as you're using it. So as you're retraining your model, if you're optimizing your model, or doing pretty much anything to the model at all, all of this can be logged in a tool called TensorBoard and um, visible to you. Now, you probably won't t look at too much of this at first, um, because there's a lot going on here. There's, there's some, some of these graphs um, I've never looked at, but the main ones that you'll be using are things like the accuracy and, and, and the loss rate, because these are inter interesting to look at when you're optimizing things. So, if you're reducing the size of your model, or if you're adding more computation steps to your model, um, you can keep an eye on the accuracy and see what's improving your model and, and what's maybe not making it so accurate. So when you, um, when you want to run TensorBoard, you can simply, simply run this TensorBoard command to run it and provide it with a directory to listen to. So as we retrain our model, the script will write um, training summary files to a, um, a specified directory. And this TensorBoard instance will essentially listen to that directory and detect changes. And as we retrain our model, and as these files get written, written to this directory, TensorBoard will um, repopulate its data, redraw its graphs, and everything literally in real time, 
as we go so we can view our models and its changes as we work on it. So when you first open TensorBoard, it will be empty um, until you start retraining your model. And TensorBoard is all run on localhost. So as soon as you run it, you can um, open up your localhost in your browser and it will be visible. But to be able to view these um, graphs in your TensorBoard instance, you first need to actually train your model and do something with it. So as I mentioned before, your model is only going to be good, as good as your data source. Um, so you need a data, data set that has plenty of uh, images, or it depends what you're training. If, you, if you're using something with text, you'll need t plenty of text examples. Um, but online, the good thing with like, data sets is there's plenty of websites online that have really good data sets available to you. Um, there's, so I, like I said, I found one that has not the most exciting thing, but fruit. So each, I found a data set that had like 500 different images of each type of fruit. And then basically what someone had done had taken a picture of um, bananas and apples at so many different angles. Um, I don't know why, but um, it was perfect because it meant that the recognition for this model was really good because um, there are so many different angles of the fruits that as I could move the fruit around and it would still be recognized. Um, so when it comes to this retrain script, script, we have our training data and we have it in, you'll notice it's in these individual directories. So with the script that TensorFlow provides for retraining your models, um, what it will do is it will use these directory names for your labels. So previously I mentioned that um, with classification techniques for training, um, the output, because we already know the output and the output is our labels. Um, so we essentially want to recognize a given, we know the output that we want to recognize. So here with these directories of our um, training data, each of our images is separated into our output labels. So a banana is an output label because it's an item we know we want to recognize. And the same holds true for all of the other directories in this training data set. So when it comes to retraining the model, um, this is the, the script that we're essentially going to run. So we're going to look a little bit more about what each of these one, um, commands does in a minute. Um, but this script is provided in the TensorFlow project and available for you to, you to use to retrain um, your models. So when you retrain a model, a lot goes on in the background. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this now. I do have um, a blog post on it but, that I'll share afterwards. But essentially, this process is quite complex, and there's a lot going on in the background. Um, but essentially, what happens is you run the retrain script, um, and then in the, within the script, you, you define an architecture that you want to use for your retraining model. It will grab that model. Um, it will perform a of magic view in the background and, and optimizations, and then the graph will be saved for you ready to use. So to look at each step of the retrain script, so when we call um, retrain, the first command that we can provide is the bottleneck directory. Um, we'll look a little bit more at the bottlenecks in a bit, but essentially this is a quite an important part of the retrain process. So whilst a bottleneck sounds like um, it's, gonna, it's a part of the network that's going to slow something down, it's a, this is actually a caching directory. So when we run the retrain script, the same um, process is run multiple times on our images. Um, and that process takes a lot of time. So what a bottleneck is, is essentially a cached um, file of that um, Im image analysis process. And so this analysis, this, this cache file will be, will be saved to these directories. And then whenever the retrain process is, is run, um, the cache will be used so that that image analysis does not have to be repeated which again, which helps in your, the, the retrain script takes time. So this will help reduce time that your retrain script takes to run. Next we have the training steps. So um, the number of steps you want to run really depends on the size of your input, the, the size of your data set. And by default, this will be 4,000 steps. But if you have thousands and thousands of images, running this on your machine could take a lot of time. Um, so it really depends on what you want to do. So the steps is basically how many times you want that training process to run on the given set of data. Then we have the, um, where is it? Oh yeah, so just to, just to point out on the, the training steps is the, tra the number of training steps like isn't just how many steps you want to do before you get to 100% accuracy. Like it's quite, you, you're, in a lot of models you probably won't reach 100% accuracy but the training steps allows you to, to define an amount you want to go through to find some form of generalized result. Um, and this is where TensorBoard comes in handy because you may be doing 6,000 steps and compared to 1,000 steps, there really may not be much in your accuracy result. So um, the amount of time that those extra 5,000 steps takes wouldn't make any sense. 
So that's where TensorBoard comes in handy to look at the differences that's coming from these training steps. So the next few directories are just kind of storage directories. So the model directory is just, um, it allows you to define a point at where your models are saved. Um, it's not too important. And the summaries directory is where, um, so whenever your retraining process takes place, um, summaries will be saved to this directory from the TensorBoard retraining script. So this is the script that we gave to our um, TensorBoard um, logging command. So we write the scripts here, and then our TensorBoard instance will be listening um, for these training summaries. The output graph is the graph that created from our um, retraining script. So this is the graph that will be used in our applications. And we can also then use this graph for optimizations that we perform later. And the output labels are, so you know I mentioned before about our data set, our directories is each of our output label names. Um, also, we can output a text file of these labels. So if we want to use these labels in our application, um, we can do. Um, you may not want to use these labels directly, you, but you can always map them to different results. So the architecture is, there's actually only two, two architectures that this script um, supports. So there's, um, if you're not familiar, there's one called Inception v3 for version 3, and there's also a mobile net architecture. So for mobile applications, um, so there's two, there's two slight differences between them. So Inception v3 is a more accurate model. Um, again, it really depends on your data set, how uh, much more accurate it is. But um, with that, more accuracy becomes a slight, slightly slower performance, and it's also slightly larger in size. So again, it really depends on your data set, and it's worth trying both. But for mobile applications, um, in a lot of cases, mobile net will make more sense because it's a lot smaller in size, and it's also a lot faster. But with that comes a trade-off of a slightly less accuracy. I think when, when I tried it with um, my fruit data set, there was only about, uh, I think it was like a 5% accuracy difference. And so it really depends on your use case and what you're using machine learning for as to whether you can make that trade-off. And the image directory is essentially the training images that you're going to be feeding to the training script. So once we've run this and we open up TensorBoard, we get shown this very scary graph. Um, so the main point here that I want to look at is the, the, bottom, the bottom section that I've pulled out. Um, so all of these are our um, pre-trained models, a pre-trained part of our script. So when we run our training process, like this whole left-hand side isn't actually touched. Um, so these are all trained in finding and summarizing the information in our images and, and used for the classification, but not the actual classification of specific objects. So when we run our pre-trained script, we don't actually touch any of this. Um, this is all going to be reused by our model. Um, we're just going to be retraining the part that's found in the right-hand side of this model. So as I mentioned before, um, the bottleneck, um, where is it? So the bottleneck is the part, um, is, is, within, is within this right-hand side of the graph. So this bottleneck isn't slowing us down, and it's just a part of the caching um, to be done in the process. So the actual only part that our retraining process touches is this node here. So each of these are nodes in our graph, um, and this can all be viewed within TensorBoard. But the only part that our retraining process is the final training operations. So what happens here is that the cached value for each image gets fed in um, to the bottleneck layer along with the label. And then each of the two of these are matched together to generate some form of calculation. Um, and once we've done all of, all of this retraining, running the retraining script in our model, um, within TensorBoard, we can view all the graphs that we saw before. So the main two ones that probably are only the interesting ones for now to look at is the accuracy and the loss function. So that training accuracy is used to show you the percentages of images in our data set that were labeled successfully or correctly. So we have the number of steps on the bottom followed by the accuracy at the top. And you can see we don't reach 100% accuracy because that's you know, going to be quite tricky to do. But you can see, um, so we, we're running all our steps along here. And as we work through it, our, our accuracy is kind of like dipping up and down. And I think we reached like something like 80 something percent. I don't know. Where is it? Yeah. So we also saw the, another useful one to look at is the loss, a loss function. So this is essentially a lower number here is a better. And this just gives you a glimpse at like how well the training process is going. And um, so you can see here as as we run through our steps, um, you can see our, um, our, loss our loss function was getting less. 
So again, this is another good one to keep an eye on because you may be running unnecessary steps in your training process that you may not need. So now we've retrained our model, and what we want to do is we want to test it. We want to know if it's doing its job properly. So to do this, we take an image that isn't actually in our training set, and we run it against our model. And this is so that we can clarify that it's actually working, and it's working properly. So I grabbed an image of banana off of Google, and we're going to run this through, our, um, through the label image script. So this, again, is something that's provided by TensorFlow. And all we do here is provide our graph that we retrained and along with the image file that we want to train it against. And when we run this, we're given an evaluation time. And so this is one of my maxes. It may vary on, on mobile devices, on, and especially on the device that you're using. Um, but we can see here that it's done a pretty good job of recognizing the banana. Um, you can see the bottom three values are pretty much like a no-go. And even the lemon is it's pretty sure it's not a lemon. But you can see it's higher, and that's because of the yellow colors in the image. It looks nothing like a lemon, but um, it's the yellow that's, that's causing the TensorFlow to think, oh, yeah, this could possibly be a match. Um, but the banana there, we're pretty sure it's one. So that's not bad. Like 0.344 seconds is, is a pretty quick recognition, and the accuracy there is pretty good. But when it comes to um, using TensorFlow on mobile devices, so we're talking about just TensorFlow here, TensorFlow Mobile here, not TensorFlow Lite, um, any pre-processing that can be done to reduce uh, the footprint that we have on our app is worthwhile. So there's a number of things we can do to optimize our models so that we reduce size and increase speed. So the one way that TensorFlow keep this library small for mobile is by not supporting a bunch of operations. So whilst these operations aren't supported, they're still actually shipped with um, the graphs that we create. So that doesn't make any sense for them to be there because we can't use them. And if we do try to use them, then the graph won't actually be loaded. It would just like, sort of give a no result. So because of this, we can essentially strip those operations from our model. And to do this, we can use a, a script called um, Optimize for Inference. So this helps us to um, avoid any problems that could be triggered by using unsupported operations. And there's also other few op optimizations that come with it, such as uh, increase in speed. And again, these speed increases aren't like, um, aren't like rocket speed, but um, all these optimizations together do add up. So running this script will take uh, our retrain graph that we previously created. We can define an output graph to be created. And as well as um, we need to define the input names which are used for our graph's input and also the output names for the output nodes. So if you didn't create the model yourself or the graph yourself, um, these may not be easily accessible. Um, sometimes you have to use a script to be able to, um, like third party scripts, you have to pull these out from the models, um, which can be a bit fiddly. But we essentially run this. Um, so once we've run this optimization script, what the first thing we want to do is also run the label image script. This is the same script that we run before to sort of test our recognition. And whenever we perform an optimization on a model, we want to perform this same operation on labeling an image again. Because this helps us to see if we've lost any accuracy, helps us to see if it was really worthwhile, if it's sped up, um, and just to see if anything's sort of gone wrong during the optimization process. So you can see here, when I run this, um, I managed to shave some time off. So it's not like a massive um, amount of time being shaved off. It's like 0 0.1 um, one, one second, um, which again, could be worthwhile on mobile. Um, and also, I don't know what happened, but um, my banana got more, more recognition percentage there. So that's not a bad thing. Um, but you can see when we compare this to the original model, the main, main thing here is um, 0 0.344 seconds to 0 0.2, I can't read that. 2.36 seconds. So there's a, you know, if you think of things like animations, um, if you shave that off of an animation or something visual to the user, it'll be recognizable. So optimizing the model in this way, um, that amount of time is shaved off. If, if you're performing recognitions repeatedly, like over and over again in your scripts, then that would be worthwhile doing because all of that time added up makes a difference. And when we optimize this model, um, again, going back to TensorBoard, and whenever you do optimizations, the cool thing about TensorBoard is they have a, a drop-down menu that you can use to switch between the different graphs you've created. So one thing to look at with this optimization is that this is on the left-hand side is before the optimization, and then after we perform this, over on the right-hand side, this whole thing is being essentially compressed, and this is where our speed increases come from. Not only does it make our graph seem less scary, and it makes it easier to see what's going on, um, we still have the same components in our graph, just, as, just without the unrequired bits. So at this point, the retrain model is still quite large in size. Um, 
So it's like 54 meg. Uh, even when we compress this in, uh, even when we zip it up, it's still 50 meg. So to reduce this even, to reduce the size of our model, because obviously we're putting it on mobile applications, that's quite, that's quite big. And um, that's probably not something you want to ship with your app. It's probably something you want to provide as an additional download from within your settings or something. But what we can do here is essentially um, quantize our model. So the majority of the space which is taken up by our graph is by the weights itself. Um, and these are large floating, block num floating point numbers. And what we could do is normalize these to reduce, um, to increase the compression that we can perform. So to do this, we have a script, another one provided by TensorFlow, which is, so all of these are already available to us. We don't have to write any of these scripts ourselves. We have one called quantize graph. And again, all we need to do here is provide our input, input graph, which is our already previously optimized graph, and provide um, the point at where we want to output our graph to. And again, providing our output nodes and also, also the mode at which we want to um, perform a quantization on. And when we run this, you can see that we've gone from, it was, I think, what was it before, like 7.8% compression rate, and we've gone all the way down to be able to compress our model at a 70% size. Um, this is a significant improvement. So especially on mobile, um, we've, I know, 60 meg is still quite a lot uh, for uh, an addition to our APK, but um, reducing it by that much is, is a win. So again, we performed an optimization on our model. So we want to check that we haven't um, you know, degraded its performance or degraded its um, evaluation time. And you can see here, our evaluation time isn't really any different. We've shaved like 0 0.002 seconds off, um, but that's not the key thing here. The key thing is the size of the model that is, uh, is included. And another thing to note is that we've lost a small bit of uh, accuracy. So again, this kind of actually loss isn't really a problem um, because you can see here that like, all the other labels um, within the results are kind of like definitely not being recognized as bananas. But I have seen different results here on different um, images that I've perform, um, performed the optimization on. And on one image I did lose like um, 0.15 accuracy, um, which went down to like 0.81% um, recognition. So it really does depend on the images that you're feeding in. So it's good to test this on different images from um, outside of your data set to be sure that you're not um, degrading your model by too much. So now at this point, we've got our model and we've retrained it to recognize, um, recognize the images that we provided it with. So the adding this to your app section is, is not too big and most of the work is done outside of, outside of Android itself. It's essentially six steps to be able to add this to your app and this will really depend on the kind of recognition that you're using TensorFlow for. So we add a dependency, we create a reference to TensorFlow we feed it data, um, we run the inference, the recognition, we fetch the result, and then we handle the confidence of an application. So TensorFlow used to be um, a bit of a pain to add to um, your Android projects, but now it's available um, via a Gradle dependency. And once we've done this, we can add a, a reference to the TensorFlow um, inference interface. And what this essentially takes is a reference to an asset manager within your Android project, and also the name of your model file. And what this class will essentially do is um, gives, you, gives you access to your assets, and then you, it uses the model file name to grab the model graph from your project. So in our case, um, this was our optimized graph.pv, or whatever one we want to use, the rounded graph or the um, retrained graph. So that's all you need to do. You place that graph with the output names inside of your assets file in your Android Studio project, and then you use this TensorFlow inference interface class to essentially fetch, um, fetch that model for use in inference. Now, because we're using imaging, I um, haven't gone too much into uh, this part of the process because it really depends on what you're using TensorFlow for. Um, but essentially, in, for image processing, um, we essentially need to grab the pixels of our image that we're using for recognition and feed that into our, um, feed that into our um, graph. So once we've done that, um, yeah, we need to do call the feed function. So what this takes again is the input name. Um, so whilst I said before, this isn't available on every, um, if you didn't make the model, you may not know the input name, but if we've done the retraining, then you would have needed to know the input name to perform some of the operations we looked at before. So this feed function essentially takes in, um, 
the, the name of our input, um, the float values that we collected, and also um, the shape of the, um, the, in, the input array. So once we've done that, um, we basically need to collect the outputs. So we've fed, we've, we've fed our data into our inference interface, but we haven't actually run um, the processing. So now the inputs are in place, um, we essentially need to give uh, an array of our output names. So these are the outputs that we want to collect. So in some TensorFlow models, you can have multiple outputs. You're not, you're not always gonna be just collecting one output. It really depends on the model that you've created. Um, but in this case, we're essentially using the output name that I've grabbed from TensorBoard. And I've passed this into the run function call. And the, that final, ver um, that final um, parameter there is just whether you want to enable logging or not, which I haven't enabled here. So now that we've run our inference, we can um, call the fetch function. So we use, this, um, we use the output name to access the output graph that we want to retrieve. And then we um, also pass in the outputs that we want to retrieve. So here we pass in the um, output name for those. This is the, the, where we want to retrieve the data from, so our result, and as well as the outputs. So once we've done so, um, what this does is the outputs of our graph are put into the outputs array that we passed in. So this is the, the number of classes is the possibilities of the results that can be, um, can, that can be retrieved. So here, um, we essentially fetch our outputs and we can do whatever we want with them. So we can loop through them. Um, so here, threshold is just, if you only wanna use the top three results, um, really depends on your use case. But like I said, because we included both our labels and our model into our project, we can um, form a loop through these outputs, fetch the label and fetch the confidence that that is that label. And then if our confidence matches a certain result or is above a certain value, then we can do something with that. So in the application, in the sample app that I just previously provided um, for, for the banana recognition, um, here I was essentially checking if the confidence level is above 0 0.9 or um, really depends again on your use case, then um, show, the, show the dialogue to allow the user to add it to the cart. So again, um, it really depends on the use case on the application. Cool, so that's it from my side. Like I said, um, it's kind of like a, just a, a brush over everything that's available, TensorFlow and an introductory look up to what we can do. Um, yeah, I'd love to answer any questions if anyone's got any. Um, I'll do my best to see what, if I can answer them. Oh, cool, yeah, we've got a bit of time. I think we've got like five minutes or so. Um, did anyone have any questions at all? Thank you so much for a great talk. Cool. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about quantization, because my, my read on what you're saying was that quantization would have an effect on download time and basically nothing else. What is the benefit of quantizing the model versus the optimization or just the choice of base model? So the quantization, the, I think the, the point I was trying to get across was, yeah, so the, the, the size of the model itself. So. If you, so you need that user, your user needs to have that model on their device. So the whole thing is that TensorFlow, you can, you can package that with your APK if you want. Um, but if you add that model to your APK, then unquantized, that model was 70 meg. Um, so if my APK is, for example, the, the buffer one's 10 meg, if I want to include that model, that's pretty big and that's going to increase the download size by quite a lot. And users might be like, oh, why, why the hell is your APK so large? And it might put people off downloading it. Um, but quantizing it and forming that, that, being able to compress it down to 12 meg or what it was, 40 meg, isn't so bad. Um, but still, that can be quite a lot um, to add on to initial APK size. Um, but what you can do is, um, or what our iOS, iOS team do with their model is, is they allow the users to download them at a later date. So you can download the zip file from within the settings or I think they show a pop-up as well at the point, oh, do you want to use machine learning or something? Um, so again, um, being able to reduce the size of that model uh, to download is quite good, especially for people who may be on data connections. Um, the, the size difference by like 65 meg is quite, is quite significant. Um, that's the main, that is the main advantage of quantization. Um, but again, you can lose accuracy, but that really depends on the data set and, and so on. Does that answer it? Cool. <laughs> Oh, 
why I would come back to him. So for the training process, do you use um, a Google Cloud GPU server or um, just like your own machine? Um, so I didn't, but you can do. Um, it really depends on what you're using it for. So the Google Cloud one you can use, that's more for like, you can use that for like real runtime um, computation, can't you? So if you, if, you, if you make a request at the time in your app and you can offload that um, machine learning into the cloud at that point in time and get the result there and then. Um, so in this application, this was just done on my machine. And all this TensorFlow was downloaded and all the retrain script was just run there and then. So the whole point is you can do all that on your, your computer when you're making something and then offload that um, model and place it into your app. Uh, thanks, Ray. Uh, great talk. Um, is it correct to say that you were using TensorFlow Mobile and not TensorFlow Lite? Is yeah. That... So I was using TensorFlow Mobile. Um, so the, the rain, I originally started using TensorFlow because this talk was a generalized one, and then um, I started writing it before I sort of started looking at TensorFlow Lite. But the differences in them really aren't that much in terms of like how they work. Um, there's a few differences with TensorFlow Lite, like again, so the, the things I said about some um, operations not being available on TensorFlow Mobile, and I think there's a couple more that aren't available on TensorFlow Lite, but the general way in which they work is pretty much the same, and you'll still do the same sort of training process and, and model generation. Cool. I just had a question about the mechanics. So the PD, PD files, the model? Oh, the dot, dot PB, yeah. And that becomes an asset or something? You include in your APK, and then you link against or ship other libraries in a particular OS level? Or? Oh, do you mean like, so the, the dot PB file, you just add that to your um, assets directory yep. in your project? Yep, and then you have to ship other TensorFlow libraries, or it's part of the... Yeah, libraries? so the TensorFlow, yeah, sorry, I didn't have a slide for that. So you add a dependency. Yep. For the TensorFlow library to your build a Gradle file. And does it matter what OS or what level of Android you use? Or? Um, I can't remember exactly what it's supported down to, but it's at least for, um, I think we run 4.0.1, um, and it's supported on there. Cool, thanks. Oh, cool. <laughs> Give you a minute. <laughs> Hi, Joe. So my question is, uh, does the model have to know anything about the image format, or is it just a set of bytes that it's processing? Yeah, it's just as you pass in essentially the bytes. Um, I, didn't, I didn't look too much into that because I didn't want to go off on off track too much. But um, yeah, you get, you get the pixel and, and the byte values, and that's what you feed, you feed in. Um, all my image files were JPEGs, so I don't know. That would be a good one to try, actually, see if there's any differences between... Probably like, wouldn't work if you, like, mix PNGs with JPEGs. Yeah, or yeah, but, um, yeah. Uh, I think we've got one down, yeah, one down here. Can we do on-device uh, training also? Like, what if the use case is that you don't want to send out the data to the server? In that case, can we do it on device? And if we can do it, are there some phones which will support it, like pixels and some phones, some phones which won't? Yeah, so you, you can do on device machine learning, but like you really need, it depends what you're doing, because in a lot of cases you'll need a lot of power. And it, yeah, it depends on the device, because if your device isn't very powerful, then it's going to struggle to do that, those computations. Um, probably going to use a lot of battery power as well. Um, so it, yeah, it really depends on what you're doing. Um, I haven't explored too much for on-device stuff because my, my entry point to machine learning was you know, taking models and loading them into apps. Um, but yeah, to answer that, yes, you can. But it really depends on the devices, um, the, the models you're using, the training you're doing, and so on. Um, it, would really, it would really be have to something you'd have to try out. But if you've got like a super powerful machine um, to do that training, then that would work. Any more questions? Oh. <laughs> Might be 
the last one. Yeah. So, um, um, do you usually want to create your own architecture or just use a pre-chain norm? So, the architecture would just, you use the ones, you have to use one of the ones that already exist, like mobile net, inception v3, there are other ones, but you don't have to use models that exist already, you can make them yourself, but that's like, can get pretty complex. And I think taking models that already exist and retraining them is a great way to sort of get started with machine learning and see what you can do with it and, and sort of ease you into it before you hit the heavy stuff, which is why I started with that. Okay, thank you. Cool. I think that's it. Cool. Um, thank you.